Esas, esos asuntos tecnológicos, como la seguridad, como la participación ciudadana, como el e-government, interactúan con estos gobiernos eh, locales, eh, municipales, eh, provinciales y, y de condado en Estados Unidos. Eh, muchas gracias a los panelistas. Sin mayor preámbulo, entonces, le damos la palabra eh, a Sergio Massa. Bueno. bueno, muy buenas tardes. Muchas gracias por la invitación y gracias a todos por darnos la posibilidad de compartir este momento con ustedes. Me parece importante para empezar a discutir el rol del de acceso del ciudadano a la información y el rol del Estado, sobre todo del Estado local, como instrumento de servicio al ciudadano, establecer primero qué significa la participación del Estado y la participación del ciudadano en las nuevas tecnologías. Si nosotros miramos hacia dónde marcha el mundo, nos vamos a encontrar con dos realidades. La primera es que en los próximos 15 años el 70% de las poblaciones van a ser poblaciones urbanas, poblaciones en ciudades. En segundo lugar, nos vamos encontrando con el enorme crecimiento del acceso de los ciudadanos a todo lo que es la utilización de las herramientas de nuevas tecnologías, de tecnologías inteligentes en términos de vínculo, con el resto de la sociedad y con el Estado. Y además nos vamos encontrando con que la descripción de pobreza o riqueza en términos de los próximos 20 años de cualquier ciudad o de cualquier país del mundo va a estar centralmente, directamente asociado al nivel de capilaridad de sus redes, al nivel de perforación de sus redes en términos de llegada a la sociedad y sobre todas las cosas al nivel de acceso de su ciudadanía a las nuevas tecnologías. Hoy estamos viviendo, así como hace 100 años el mundo vivió la re revolución industrial, hoy estamos viviendo una revolución que es la revolución tecnológica que indudablemente está cambiando los paradigmas de relación del Estado con sus ciudadanos, pero también está cambiando la relación entre los ciudadanos. Y tenemos una realidad que es que la aldea global, la aldea única, producto de la globalización de la información, solamente tiene el reflejo de la democracia directamente en las aldeas locales, en las comunidades, en los gobiernos locales, en las ciudades, como única expresión de correlato, entre, de correlato directo entre el ciudadano y su gobierno a la hora de buscar respuestas. De manera tal que el ingreso de los estados, ya sean estados nacionales, ya sean organizaciones estaduales o ya sean organizaciones de jurisdicción local, a la utilización de las nuevas tecnologías como herramienta de servicio y de contacto con el ciudadano. Entendemos nosotros que es imprescindible no solamente en el presente, sino en términos de futuro para cambiar el paradigma de relación entre gobernantes y ciudadanos. En ese sentido, hay situaciones que tienen que ver con el uso de las nuevas tecnologías en términos de vínculo con el ciudadano y hay situaciones que tienen que ver con el uso de las nuevas tecnologías en términos de organización y funcionamiento interno del Estado. Y me parece que es importante establecer cuáles son los vehículos de vínculo directo con el ciudadano y cuáles son los vehículos de organización de funcionamiento con el, de, del propio Estado. En ese sentido, lo primero, lo primario que aparece en términos de relación es las herramientas de control ciudadano. Los mecanismos eh, de vínculo directo del ciudadano con el Estado a través de las redes y a través de los servicios construidos de centrales de reclamos, de centrales de mecanismos directos de decisión o de toma de decisiones del Estado para la participación del ciudadano que permitan de una forma o de otra establecer mecanismos de control por parte del ciudadano para con el Estado, pero también de vínculo del Estado para con el ciudadano. En ese sentido, la administración de las centrales de reclamo y los tableros de gestión y de control de esas centrales de reclamo son fundamentales no solamente para establecer el funcionamiento y para establecer la eficiencia del funcionamiento del Estado, sino sobre todas las cosas para establecer un mecanismo de respuesta directa entre el ciudadano y el Estado, para medir la capacidad de respuesta y para medir la eficiencia en la respuesta entre el ciudadano y el Estado. En segundo lugar, claramente aparece en lo que es el vínculo en el servicio los mecanismos de devolución de la respuesta del ciudadano o de la respuesta al ciudadano por parte del Estado en términos de vehículos de información que permitan desde 
las herramientas de pago, las herramientas de tramitación y las herramientas de eh, devolución del reclamo como mecanismos de devolución del Estado de un servicio al ciudadano que en definitiva es el contribuyente que paga los impuestos. En tercer lugar, creemos con una experiencia personal muy exitosa que en todo lo que tiene que ver con las tecnologías aplicadas a la seguridad, que sobre todo en los países en vías de desarrollo aparece como uno de los temas de mayor preocupación, es muy importante la aplicación y el uso de las nuevas tecnologías a la hora de eh, llevar adelante herramientas de prevención que permitan garantizar tranquilidad, calidad de vida al ciudadano. Y en ese sentido nos parece fundamental que los centros de monitoreo y control, que las herramientas de videovigilancia, que las herramientas de alerta a través de la utilización de las tecnologías emergentes de los smartphones, que las herramientas de tecnología de alerta a través de la utilización de las propias redes de datos y de las propias redes de telefonía sean el mecanismo a través del cual el ciudadano tenga un contacto directo de reclamo, de solicitud de urgencia, de solicitud de emergencia con el Estado y que el Estado tenga la capacidad de la comunicación inmediata y directa con el ciudadano y sobre todo la capacidad de respuesta a partir de ese reclamo de carácter inmediato. Nosotros sentimos que la inmediatez en la respuesta, sobre todo en las emergencias, es fundamental a la hora de determinar que el uso de las nuevas tecnologías rinde, sirve en términos de eh, funcionamiento y vínculo con el ciudadano. El otro eje o, el otra, o la otra herramienta fundamental tiene que ver con el control de los servicios. La existencia de la utilización de las nuevas tecnologías en lo que son las redes de servicios públicos para el control de funcionamiento, para el control de eficiencia, para el control del gasto, pero sobre todas las cosas para detectar los errores de funcionamiento es fundamental a la hora de brindar eficiencia en el servicio por parte del Estado local a los ciudadanos. Y en ese sentido, la utilización de las tecnologías satelitales y de las tecnologías de control y monitoreo de redes en cada una de las redes de servicios de aguas, de cloacas, de saneamiento, en las, en las redes de servicios de alumbrado público de semaforización, con asistencia y con monitoreo remoto, es fundamental para garantizar una eficiente prestación de servicio por parte del Estado local a los ciudadanos, pero además para tener capacidad de respuesta frente al reclamo del ciudadano. El otro punto que nosotros creemos importante desarrollar tiene que ver con lo que es la administración del Estado y el vínculo con el contribuyente. Los mecanismos de pago y de gestión de trámites de manera eh, remota, de manera electrónica, son fundamentales para cambiar el vínculo del ciudadano con el Estado, pero sobre todas las cosas, para darle un vehículo de interacción al ciudadano con el Estado que permita de manera eficiente, de manera rápida y sobre todas las cosas, con control por parte de ambos, tener un mecanismo que dé un ida y vuelta, pero que sobre todas las cosas permita cambiar el paradigma de la existencia del papel. Así como nos planteamos que las herramientas de gobierno electrónico, ya sea para capacitación a través de los e-learning, ya sea para funcionamiento a través de las herramientas de promoción como los e-commerce locales, ya sea para herramientas de funcionamiento interno a través de las intranet, son importantes para el normal funcionamiento y ejercicio de desarrollo de las organizaciones locales, los mecanismos de funcionamiento que permitan comunicación externa con el ciudadano, pero con inmediatez en la respuesta en materia de vehículos de pago, vehículos de tramitación, vehículos de sistemas de reclamo, son fundamentales a la hora de establecer un mecanismo de eh, eficiencia y sobre todas las cosas de velocidad adaptado a las nuevas tecnologías en materia de funcionamiento del vínculo Estado-Ciudadano. Creemos además que hay un cambio de paradigma que tiene que venir acompañado de un cambio en los sistemas educativos. Vivimos en una sociedad que construyó sus sistemas educativos asociados a la lógica de la revolución industrial. Los módulos, el presentismo, las formas, tienen que ver centralmente con un sistema educativo que construyó al ciudadano, al educando, en términos del de funcionamiento de la industria como motor de la economía. Y creemos que hoy 
la revolución que estamos viviendo, el nuevo paradigma de revolución tecnológica y de cambio en los sistemas de comunicación y de videocomunicación en el mundo, nos obligan a cambiar el paradigma en el sistema educativo. Y en ese sentido nos encontramos con la contradicción de que los sistemas educativos tienen alumnos nativos digitales, pero docentes que no son nativos digitales y que tienen dificultades a la hora de construir un nuevo vínculo con el alumno a partir de entender que el alumno, el proceso de información, la toma de conocimiento, la produce desde las distintas herramientas que le da, le da hoy la tecnología y que el proceso de educación o de formación tiene que estar orientado a saber seleccionar, separar y bien utilizar esa información que va receptando, que va incorporando de las distintas redes existentes. En ese sentido entendemos que el cambio fundamental es que hoy el sistema educativo no solamente necesita la incorporación de eh, nuevas tecnologías que trabajen en la eliminación de la brecha digital en los alumnos, sobre todo de los niveles iniciales, sino que el desafío más importante es establecer un cambio en el sistema de formación y de capacitación de los docentes. Los niveles iniciales tienen el problema más grave en que está roto el vínculo entre el docente y el alumno producto de que la mejor utilización de las nuevas tecnologías está en manos del alumno y no del docente. Y creemos que en ese sentido, así como los estados se plantean un desafío de cambio en términos de vínculo con el ciudadano a partir de la utilización de las nuevas tecnologías, culturalmente el cambio se va a producir cuando tengamos la capacidad de generar un cambio profundo en los sistemas educativos, entendiendo que el modelo de sistema educativo que traemos producto de 100 años de revolución industrial, hoy requiere inexorablemente en todos los países en vías de desarrollo un cambio de paradigma asociado a la nueva revolución tecnológica en la que estamos viviendo. Creo que los países, las ciudades, los estados tienen en el desarrollo de sus redes, en el desarrollo de sus fibras, en el desarrollo de sus tecnologías, pero sobre todo de los carriers, de las herramientas de comunicación, el principal desafío. En la medida que entendamos que el cambio sustancial en términos de pobreza hoy no se da solamente en términos de acceso a determinada calidad de vida, sino de acceso a determinada calidad de contenidos, vamos a entender lo que nos está pasando como sociedad. Si nosotros logramos generar niveles de capilaridad en términos de redes, niveles de accesibilidad en términos a nuevas tecnologías, para todas las sociedades vamos a estar ganando la batalla más importante en términos de pobreza hacia el futuro. Así como se determinaba en acceso a determinada calidad de vida la pobreza, en el viejo paradigma de medición de pobreza, hoy el nuevo paradigma de medición de pobreza va a tener que ver inexorablemente con el acceso a las nuevas tecnologías. Y entonces el desafío que tenemos los países, las provincias, las ciudades, es garantizar accesibilidad y redes con capacidad para que todos los niveles de información que fluyen en los distintos sistemas, en las distintas capas, puedan ser accesibles para nuestros ciudadanos. Muchas gracias. Gracias, gracias Intendente Massa, por compartir su visión desde el Estado. Tenemos eh, unos retos que van entonces desde la propia organización interna en términos fiscales, de promoción y de fomento empresarial, hasta decisiones mucho más estructurales frente a los, al acceso o al cierre de la brecha digital, así mismo como el cambio en los paradigmas educativos. Saltemos entonces de esta visión desde el gobierno que nos acaban de presentar a una visión, digamos, desde la materia prima de esta apertura de los gobiernos abiertos, que es la información, y especialmente la información pública. Helen Darbyshire. Muchas gracias. Buenas tardes. Voy a hablar en inglés. Um, so my name is Helen Darbyshire. I'm director of uh, Access Info Europe, which is an organization which works to promote open government. Um, for those of you who don't recognize, this is the um, dome on top of the, the Bundestag in, uh, in Berlin, and I rather like it as a, a symbol of transparency. And it's a two-way transparency. It's 
the government, the citizens being able to see in, but also, importantly, the government being able to see out in order to understand the world in which it, it is operating. Um, I just want to, well, there's a lot of excitement, and we've heard it here these days, there's a lot of excitement about transparency and open data and the possibilities of opening up government information. But we should remind ourselves, perhaps, that these are not new ideas. This gentleman is the gentleman who wrote the world's first access to information law back in, in I don't know if anyone knows, Sweden in 1766. So it's an idea that's taken a little bit of time to catch on, but some of the benefits to society of government transparency really have been around for quite a long time. And one of the questions that I want to ask is, why is it still so difficult? Why are we still struggling to get access to information? We've seen a huge growth in the last few years of access to information laws around the world. We now have 95 countries around the world which have a legal tool by which citizens have a right to ask for and receive information from government. Rather interestingly, as people from Spain in the room will know, Spain is not yet one of those countries. Although the latest news I've had is that the future transparency law, which is quite a weak instrument in fact, left the, um, it has been passed by the Spanish Senate today. Um, one of the reasons that Access Info is based in Madrid is precisely because um, there was a need to campaign for a law on access to information in Spain. I'd also just like to remind, let us remind ourselves that the UN Human Rights Committee and various other international tribunals have concluded that access to information is a fundamental right. It's a fundamental right that's linked to our right to participate and it's also a right linked to um, freedom of expression so that we can have information in order to be able to form an opinion, express that opinion and engage in public life, engage in uh, discussions about the kind of government that we want and hold government to account, as Sergio mentioned, the need for citizen control of government activity. And I'm trying to watch the clock, but the clock's flashing red already. Um, I'll get my watch out. Um, okay, I'm not going to dwell on the, the legal side of things, but uh, the PowerPoint will be available and I've got put in here the language from the UN Human Rights Committee, these are the female members of the Human Rights Committee, um, about the kind of information we have a right of access to. Um, also to say that the UN Human Rights Committee has said that there are two obligations, the right to respond to requests and the obligation to publish information proactively, which is where we get a link between access to information as a right and the open data movement. And here's the language they've got about a duty to publish. State parties, governments should make every effort to put proactively in the public domain and ensure easy, prompt and effective access to information held by public bodies. So this is a legal obligation as well as a good idea as the uh, um, as we've been hearing many reasons these days why it's beneficial for governments to open up data. We've also heard about new initiatives that um, have been coming along, such as the Open Government Partnership, the latest democratic club of 61 countries who are talking to, meeting to talk together recently, two weeks ago in London, at a huge meeting, um, meeting to talk about how to use new technologies in order to open up more government data. And yet at the same time, there are many big data sets which are still not accessible. And we heard an example uh, earlier today of company registers. The G8 in its declaration this June identified company registers as one of the data sets which it's ex essential to have access to in a democratic society. They enumerated a number of other data sets. From Access Info, we just requested the company registers from uh, 40 countries around Europe using the access to information law, and we didn't get a single one. And I want to come back to look at the obstacles to accessing large data sets, which we still have 
in the way? What stands between us and our data as members of the public? What are the obstacles that we're facing? I think it's really important to identify in the world of hype about open data, it's important to look at what's still not public and why not. And I think the first thing is a reaction from public officials that it's somehow their data, that it's not public data. This data hugging, as it's being called, reaction not to release data. We saw a variant of that recently in Barcelona with the, a, a reaction. I don't really quite know what lay behind it, but there was a story of a, a young guy who built a, a, a mobile phone application, which was, and then there was a reaction from the um, regional authority about whether or not this was, uh, he could take the data and use it for his mobile phone application. And after a bit of a reaction from the public and in the media, the, um, the government body stepped back and said, yes, of course, you can use this data. But that we see day in, day out, public officials being reluctant to release and share their data, even in a context where there is a lot of progress being made on opening up public data. The second reaction from public officials, which I come across very often, is the data's not really ready for release. The data needs checking because it's maybe not fully correct. It may have errors in it, or we haven't separated out the personal data from other fields within the data set. Um, this is a problem which clearly needs to be addressed by anticipating disclosure and working to design it into the construction of our data set, but it's a huge problem, particularly in contexts where we're very nervous about re accidental releases of uh, personal data. I, I saw some laughter in the audience there, so I know I'm on with this, but the, the, it's an issue. The third con obstacle to opening up data is a fear of the consequences. And to take just one example, because I think it's a very good example, but there are many. Um, in the UK, there was talk about publishing the death rates after operations, which would include identifying the surgeons who had the highest number of death rates. And this was hugely controversial for many reasons which we can imagine, including the effect that it would have on the professional lives of these surgeons to know that they had more patients dying on them than somebody else. In the end, after a public debate, uh, the data was released. First of all, the consequences that were feared did not come to pass. But secondly, the British government is now saying that as a result of making this data open, it's reduced death rates because there is greater communication and discussion between the medical professionals about how to, uh, you know, what, how come you've got fewer patients dying than I have? What, what new techniques are you using? So sometimes not only do the anticipated fears not prove to be real fears or necessary fears, but there are benefits which were not always anticipated. Fourth obstacle, very simply, it's embarrassing. There's a lot of data which holds, which governments hold, which is, contains potential to embarrass. And the political cost in short-term electoral cycles is potentially high. Um, we've been working on accessing data about the CIA secret flights. Um, that's clearly an embarrassment for many European countries. And it's interesting how we got data from some countries. Uh, Portugal is one in the neighborhood here, but not from others such as, as Spain. Um, about the flights which flew through those countries. Um, th this is a, an, another example from Italy of data about the earthquake readiness of schools. Uh, I don't have time to go into it now, but it's, it's very interesting to admit, perhaps, um, that your data will reveal uh, a systemic problem such as the fact that many schools, in this case, are not earthquake ready in Italy. And the fifth obstacle, and it's a very important and significant obstacle, is money. So many data sets, big data sets, are still being charged for. And we have an issue of where we have public bodies whose economic model depends on selling the data, how are we going to restructure their economic model so that the data can be released and yet the meteorological office or the geospatial mapping agency or whoever it may be can carry on doing their work of gathering the data. There needs to be a more, um, I think we need more debate about how to transit from uh, an old 
non-open data economic model to an economic one. And I don't see enough discussion about that. What are the solutions? We clearly need leadership and vision. We need real commitment to open. We need champions and activists both inside government and talking to people on the outside. That's happening, but as I say, it's going relatively slowly. We do need to look at public procurement models and uh, data, so IT planning in order to design disclosure into data sets. And we need to agree on the standards. And this is where I'm going to finish up, just talking about the standards for open government. Because in the context of the Open Government Partnership, we've been looking at the standards that exist, and it's all over the place. Different governments are committing to opening up different data sets. There's no real agreement on what the core data sets in a democracy, which should absolutely as a priority be open, is. We started seeing progress on that this year with the G8 declaration, but it's been going very slowly. And what we're seeing is a lot of bus timetables and not enough information about the education system, health system, the running of social services, the human rights protection. Uh, I've been doing another research project on getting information about the detention of migrants, including minors. It's incredibly hard across Europe to get up-to-date data on the number of minors um, who have been detained on grounds of illegal immigration. And these, these are issues which we need to know about, not only to protect the rights of those minors, but also because we're in a situation in Europe where we're getting a very dangerous, I believe, racist, xenophobic discourse coming up, and we don't always have the data to counter the allegations which are being made by more populist um, elements in the society. So there's a lot of reasons for opening up this data. Um, development and how we're addressing the financial crisis. What's really going on? I heard someone from the OECD complain recently that they weren't able to get all the, the macroeconomic assumptions underlying the budget predictions of many of their member states. If the OECD can't get the data needed to really understand what's going on in the financial crisis, I think we've got serious problems. So we should be focusing on the data that's going to help us get out of some of our current problems. And that's the website, and thank you very much. Gracias. Pasando ahora, después de la información, a los protagonistas, a los ciudadanos que van a utilizar esa información dentro de este esquema de gobernabilidad de una ciudad inteligente, una ciudad smart. Alan Shark hablará sobre el, la, el involucramiento ciudadano, cómo podemos usar esas tecnologías para que los ciudadanos participen, cómo podemos tener a esos habitantes de una ciudad involucrados y enganchados a, un, a una ciudad inteligente. Alan Shark. Thank you. Thank you for all, for being here. We, we were having a contest to see how many people would be here. We all lost. So this is very encouraging. Um, and thank you. Um, I have the, uh, the luck uh, of having two jobs. I'm both a professor and I also operate an NGO outside of Washington, D.C., and we help local governments. And one of the things that uh, we have been focusing on is smart cities, and it's very difficult after 300 speakers, I think I counted 320 speakers that have spoken the last three days, how can I possibly say anything new other than I can say I disagree with everything that's been said? But that's not true either. So let me tell you a little bit about the lens in which I see things. Uh, this is about our association. And don't worry, I'm not going to read every slide. Um, I'm understanding that this will be published for you. We do a lot of things in the States. We do webinars. We do research. We do an awful lot. And as I mentioned, smart cities is one of the areas that we're spending a lot of time on. But something to keep in mind. Rome and Pompeii were once considered smart cities. And we know what happened there. Now, in the case of Rome, clearly, Rome has come back to life. It's done very well. And there's a list, I have a list of something like 40 or 50 cities that were so well known in a moment in time that did not survive a certain period of time. In most cases, they have come back and they've reinvented themselves. But we have something new that I have not heard too much here, just a little bit, and that is what happened to Pompeii. Um, you know, when you live by an earthquake, you know, there's a problem. Uh, and I'm sure they just felt that uh, everything's going to be okay and it's not going to happen during my watch and we know what happened there. But now with global warming, and we see what's happening with rising sea levels, there's 
a tremendous threat to cities across the world that live in the path uh, of the rising tide. So there are some issues here. So to me, smart cities is really kind of like excellence. It is more of a journey than a destination. It's something that's a process that gets us from one point to the other, and it's a constant rechecking of where we are. So the point I want to make is I want to talk about data, information, and citizen engagement. To me, they're not the same, but they're all related. What I think what we really need to think about, and I think our first speaker did a very good job of that, um, is we have to think about not just smart cities, but smart people. Because without that, we really uh, do, are, are missing some a major uh, important ingredient. So what is a smart city? Let's begin with that. And I think this runs well with everything that's been said during the last three days. It really revolves around mobility, getting around, transportation. It does center on citizen engagement. They must be involved. Smart data, absolutely. Broadband has to be the, the nucleus that puts us together. We need to be able to visualize data, be able to really look at geospatial systems and how that comes together. And more importantly, we need to have the sustaining leadership, vision, and commitment to make it work because managing a smart city kind of mode requires a different kind of leadership, stepping above the silos, and we're not used to that. Many governments in the United States and across the world have tried different things to encourage citizens to tell us what they want. And I have to drop back for a second and say, why are we doing all these things? And the answer, again, this is where my professor part comes in, I think, and that is, before we ask how and what, we have to ask why are we doing this? And I think most of us will agree that one of the reasons that's motivating us is not because people are screaming that they want this information, it is that we feel an obligation in public affairs and administration to offer people more things that will help re-engage a sense of trust. I think what we're dealing with is a crisis in democracy as we move to a digital democracy. I'm not saying anything new, but to me that's an important impediment in terms of moving forward. We're doing it to restore trust. That's why we're giving data out there. Although to me, data and information are not the same. In the States, we have all these wonderful websites that are now offering data, raw data sites. And a number of people have expressed an interest in that because they want to see data, they want to develop apps and do something with it. To me, the missing ingredient has been, how do we use this information? To me, information is a step above data. Data is about numbers. Information takes that and then it leads to wisdom, of course. But these sites primarily are just giving statistics on things, and sometimes when cities do that, it doesn't give a clear enough picture. Let me give you two examples. A city might say, we collected 900 metric tons of garbage in the last X months. The public is more concerned about, was my street clean? Was my garbage picked up? Were the old mattresses taken out of the alleys? Another statistic, a city says, we inspected 332 restaurants and 18 failed. The public wants to know which ones failed and what was it that they failed from? So how government keeps information and what the public wants, there is a divide right there that has to be reconciled. And we need to find out what those data sets are or better yet, the information that the public wants. They want more information about not how many streets have been paved, but was their ride smooth in terms of getting from point A to point B. So it's more than just a pretty website. And even in the EU, a big open data movement uh, is underway as well. And I applaud that, but I think there's some missing pieces because I basically state, do citizens really want to come home after a hard day and read government data? By a show of hands, how many people want to go home and read data? I don't see any hands. Now, I did this once before, and there were three people. They were professors, and they were accountants, and they love spreadsheets. I'm more visual, as you can see. People don't, but they do want to make sure the trains are running on time. They want to make sure that government is performing as it needs to. And if it means giving data so that NGOs can take that information and reformulate that from data to information that is useful to the public, then that, to me, is the goal that we should be striving for. So, how do we find out what's going on among our citizens? Well, there's what I call the automated, the new, the soft, perhaps the old, but I think it's not one or the other. I know a number of young professionals who say, that soft stuff is so old, we don't need to do that. We can find out everything we need by the built-in app analytics. We can find out which ones are being used, we can tell from what device they're being used. We can tell how long they've been on it, how often they use it. We can tell where they're using it. It's amazing what we can learn just from the built-in apps. 
Then we have Google Analytics that can be added to many things that uh, may be uh, third party. We have Hootsuite that looks at all the different tweets that can help people develop a whole system of monitoring what goes on for your particular social media websites, in particular government. Then of course this thing called tracking. We want to know more about distance and location of where people, how they're moving, times of day they're moving. New York City just published a, a statistic last night. Um, they had the highest ridership in the, uh, in the last, um, I think, 20 years of the New York City subway system, where they had something like 5.6 million people take the train in one day in October. And then also tracking preferences, just like a business. What do people like without necessarily attributing to the individual? The soft, which is what we heard today in some of the sessions, hey, let's not forget about the community groups. We may get better data from the automated piece, but the community groups are tied into the public piece, to the human element. And sometimes they can play an enormously important role in serving the bridge between government and citizens. This includes surveys, focus groups, town meetings, polls. I would never eliminate that from my toolbox just because automation gives us some very compelling numbers. I looked at Philadelphia as a good example. We had the CIO from Philadelphia here earlier in this uh, conference, one of our members. I mean, they've created something called Philly 311. In the United States, 311 is a, something like 911. You punch three numbers. In this case, you get somebody at the city who can answer questions just about any area uh, where somebody may have a problem or an issue. Now, most big cities have this kind of feature. Um, but what separates Philly is their dedication to going beyond just taking a picture and talking about a pothole, uh, talking about a, uh, some service that is falling short, they really are encouraging something that, um, and I don't have a pointer, but it's like My Philly Rising, in the bottom uh, right-hand corner. My Philly Rising, which has a whole social cadre of human beings working so that people can click on a particular neighborhood and find out what's going on and being engaged right in that locality. And I know very few uh, governments that are doing that, so that's the great thing that we can learn from the experiences of each other. They have a whole program that's not just based on technology. Technology helps. And then we have the uh, struggling effort in the US government. I kind of applaud this. Is in the old days, we used to sign a petition. And if you had enough signatures, the motion would at least be considered. Now we're trying to figure out, how does this work in a digital world? And so the US uh, has created the White House as we the people, your voice in our government. Now, it's had a few false starts. The first time, which I think is very um, intriguing, the first time they tried this, uh, it failed because a small group of people who were very much and passionate uh, for the legalization of marijuana kind of said, this is going to be a great opportunity for us, reached out through social media, had millions of people weigh in on it, um, which was not representative of the entire population. So we always have to safeguard how does this work um, with um, maintaining that. Now you have to register. Uh, there's a way that you can look at previous uh, petitions. You can create your own. Very, very innovative site. It's too early to tell how well it's working, but certainly uh, we can learn a lot from both uh, the successes or failures. And then with government workers, we have things like GovLoop, which is a nice social media site that is 99% government folks just talk to each other about how do we improve our best practices. And then we see experiments. A newer one just came out last month called iCitizen that helps any citizen track records and it will show how they're voting on issues in their given area. So it's all about participation uh, in their area. So we have really moved kind of interesting from a point of posting to transacting to reacting to interacting. And this is really where I'm getting to the essential portion of, of my talk. Let me tell you what I believe citizen engagement really is. And then I'm going to tell you what it's not. I mean, first, let me tell you what it's not. It's not about online credit card transactions. That's e-government. That's come and gone. It's not about using cool mobile device apps. It's not about public safety broadband alerts. It's not about filling out online forms or about stunningly attractive websites, and some are. And it's not about tweeting or being a fan. All these things are important. But is that really citizen engagement? If you look at the definition, it means more of a two-way kind of interaction. So here's what I believe citizen engagement really is. It's creating a meaningful two, a, a dialogue, two-way dialogue or multi-dialogue with people. Two-way communications focuses on the processes, informing and seeking comments on things and initiatives, articulating values, meaningful participation, and possibly even voting. So that to me is very significant, a real shift in terms of e-government to e-democracy. And that's where we are. We really need smart people 
to be in smart cities. So here are two resources. Don't worry, I don't get a penny for this. Books that I have that you can get on Amazon or Kindle. One isn't out yet, it'll be out in January. A number of people have been to this conference are in that. Uh, so uh, interesting reads about some of the subjects I've just talked about. And this is my contact information, and I ended early so we could have a discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Alan Sharp.